Hello, this is Roman Gabriel, and you are listening to The Grilling Truth. Welcome, everybody, to The Grilling Truth NFL Legends Show, brought to you by Gridar Mo, an interactive football app where you get to call what the offense or defense should do during a live NFL game and see what all other fans have called also. Check out Gridar Mo at www.gridarmo.com. I'm your host for The Legend Show, Mike Goodpaster, and I want to welcome in today a man that wasn't just a great football player, also won a gold medal in the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. Help me welcome former Rams return man, wide receiver, Ron Brown. Hey, how you doing, buddy? All right, great to have you in. Um, now, I, I read up a little bit about you this morning. Um, you were also a really good baseball player, um, of course, track, football. Tell us a little bit about your early life and what was your first love. Uh, actually, my first love was baseball. You know, we were uh, played a lot of baseball in Pop Warner and Junior All-American. And then um, I became a home run hitter. So, I, so it was like a real good, the passion of mine for that baseball. But when I got to high school, no one would go to the baseball games. You know, everybody went to the football games, so I started playing football. Yeah. All right. Well, what, when did track come into play? I'm sorry. When did the track come into play? Uh, around the same time in high school, just going to track meets. I like that individual competition, you know. And uh, it, it was track was a lot of fun. Track track actually became my number one sport because I I, I really enjoyed the individual competition. You know. All it's right. Just, Go ahead. Sorry about that, Ron. No, it's just that, you, you know, you train hard, you win, it's on you. Yeah, where football, you can do everything right, quarterback doesn't get you the ball, and you lose the game anyway. <laughs> yeah. So. But that's still a lot of fun, too, though. Because football is not only a sport, it's a lifestyle, though. That's why I enjoy that game. All right, so what led you to go to Arizona State? I read a little bit that you really like Frank Cush. That was one of the main reasons you went there. Frank Cush was the reason why I went there, though. He was one of those disciplined coaches, and I was kind of one of those natural athletes, but I didn't really work work at it. And my coach at my high school was like, look, if you go over here, um, this coach will bring the best out in you. So I said, well, that's where I want to go. Well, what kind of effect did it have when, I think, five games into your college career that let Coach Cush go? You know, that was a real disappointment for for him, you know, you know, because Coach Cush was one of those kind of guys who's a winning coach, who's a disciplined coach, and you know, you know, he's you 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 hate him, but you love him at the same time because he's going to make you be the best you can be, and he tells you that when you come in, you know, or, or else or else this program won't be for you. So you know, he puts a challenge in front of you when you first get there, though. So it was a little disappointing. You know, after all that thing happened to him, and he ended up losing that position. But you know, he was still he was still around the program, and it's still the house that Cush built. All right. So you, the one thing I didn't know about you is your first three years, you were actually a defensive back. You want to tell us what led to the switch to wide receiver? Uh, my my senior year, we didn't have any wide receivers, and we had a lot of defensive backs. So um, my coach asked me that I want to go on the other side and see if we can, you know, help us on the other side especially with the speed and all. He had some uh, – Coach Baker was a genius when it comes to running different offenses and stretching the field and stuff. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. I just – whatever I can do to help the team. So, now, was the switch difficult for you? No, nah, I wasn't, though, because I just like football. So, you know, it, it, it was cool. I still never really learned how to be a receiver. But, you know, if it's just about running and running patterns and stuff like that, I figure I could, I could figure that part out. All right, so tell, talk to us a little bit about the highlights of your career at Arizona State. I know there's some really good players around you. I know you guys ended up beating Oklahoma in the Fiesta Bowl your last year there. Yeah, and that was that was probably the highlight, that one the last year, though, because I had some good friends that went to Oklahoma, and there were some Sooners, and a couple guys I grew up with in L.A., so it was good to play against those guys and um, having a victory in that game. That was a great game for us. All right, so we'll transition a little bit. Tell us how the Olympics came about. Well, you know, there was a gentleman named Carl Lewis that, that was the fastest man in the world at the time. And he and I had been competing against each other uh, since high school. Actually, I saw him at a couple of different championship high school races. And, you know, he was just that guy, though. He was So the target was high as far as who could beat him and, you know, if he can be beaten. So I put myself to that challenge. So, you know, going into my senior year, 
uh, we had an indoor a couple of indoor races, and I was able to to be victorious in a couple of indoor races. And I said, okay, well now we need to take this to the outdoor though. Now now that I'm starting to understand this track, and I'm starting to still haven't you know ran my best race yet though. But I know that I eventually will put that together, and, and I'm excited to see what that looks like. So. You know, I, I beat him going into my senior you know, my senior year, and then the draft was 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 coming up, and you know, and then I was drafted by the Cleveland Browns, and they wanted to know if I wanted to play football, and I did at the time, and then we started running outdoors, and I beat Carl Lewis again outdoors, and and he was favored to win the gold medal, and I said, you know what, I I think I can win a gold medal. I wasn't gonna do it just to make the team. I wanted to try to win the, the gold medal. That's what I was shooting for. So. I said, okay, well, if I beat him this this time, I can beat him again. And I still didn't run my best race yet, so that, yeah. that had to put another challenge out to myself. All right, so take us to L.A., the Olympics, 1984. I mean, what, what's it like walking out during the opening ceremonies? That was exciting. Uh, but the, the scary part for me, though, was really not the Olympics as much as those Olympic trials, though, because, you know, regardless of, you know, you, you I turned down the money from the NFL to – pursue my Olympic dream, but still anything can happen. You can pull a hamstring, you know, God was with me through that whole journey though. And like he's always been through my life, but you know, it it was anything could happen. I never thought of anything negative. I was always positive about what my mission and my dream was going to be. And Olympic trials was tough. And I remember in the finals, you know, it was all coming down to 10 seconds. They're only taking three and the fastest four. And, you know, it was 10 guys in that race, and everybody who was somebody was in that race. Like, if you would have predicted who was going to be in the finals, going to see who would make the Olympic team, everybody was there that day and ready to go. And I remember walking back to my blocks thinking, okay, well, it's coming down to these next 10 seconds. <laughs> That's going to make all the difference in your future these next 10 seconds. All right, so, so what was the feeling when you'd made the team? It was a great feeling. You know, anytime you're able to have dreams and live your dreams, it's always good. You know, that's always a great feeling. And that's what that became to me. That was, a, you know, being able to dream on making the team and actually accomplishing that is, is fantastic. All right. And talk to us a little bit about the experience at the Olympics. Well, the Olympics was a lot of fun at the time, you know, because I was – my agent was working on the trade from Cleveland to L.A. at the time, and, and uh, Coach Robinson actually came out to, to the couple of the races uh, in, at the Olympics, and you had a chance to chat with him a little bit. And, you know, it was kind of like just an exciting time for me in my life, you know. And, you, you know, I, I took fourth in the 100. Uh, I had messed around and injured myself in the preliminaries training, uh, rushing through a workout, and I had I couldn't work out anymore. I just had to rest it and just just run heat. So that worked out okay for me. But I was struggling through the heat because I didn't want to re-injure it, re-injure myself, or injure it anymore leading up to the finals. But I ended up taking fourth in the finals, which which didn't allow me to get a medal though. But you know I I did what I could do, and then in the relay, you know we felt that we got the baton around, we would win the race, but we wanted to get a get a set of world record. And we end up achieving that, and that was that was great. Yeah, I, had, I guess you know, all Sam Grady. You said would still have been good for third place in the 2012 Olympics. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I mean, that's yeah, amazing. Still, that's what that's, almost 30 that's years pretty later. Pretty good, right? Yeah. We still would have took. We still would have took third. You know, 30 years later. <laughs> so, what, Not, what's it look like? You win the Olympic gold medal um, to stand on there, to stand on top of the podium while they play your country's national anthem. Oh yeah, that's 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 once again, you know, one of those dreams. You, I was always one of those kind of guys that I would picture myself where I'm not, though. So I had already visualized that, though. So it was kind of deja vu for me when I got up there because I had already envisioned me being there, and so it was just like you know, so surreal to actually accomplish that, you know, and then look back on the journey it took to get here. And you know, like I said, God is good, man. You know, when he, you and then when you have a passion for something and that becomes your purpose, and, you know, things just kind of make sense. All right. Now, you had to be happy to end up in Los Angeles as opposed to Cleveland. Nothing bad against Cleveland, but it's a lot nicer out there, and that's where you're from, so. Yeah. No, that was that was good, though. And then when I got there, too, though, you know, you know, all, all my guys that were, you know, already there, you know, Johnny Johnson, Eric Dickerson, Henry Eller, Drew, uh, George Farmer, 
you know, Drew, he was all my guy, all, all my dudes, they welcomed me, you know what I mean? So it was like, you know, like we were old friends as soon as I landed there. So it was, it was a lot of fun. All right, you talked a little bit about John Robinson. You want to talk a little bit more? Tell us what your relationship was with Coach Robinson. Coach Robinson was a great coach. He was a patient guy, though, and, and you know, and he was a smart coach too, though. And and I was still learning football, though, because I really didn't know football even then. Even when I got to the Rams, I didn't know and really didn't know anything about playing wide receiver. So I was still learning as I was there, though. So he was there, real patient with me, you know, as I was, you know, going through that whole little journey trying to understand this game. I understand it more now that I'm not playing than I did while I was playing, if that makes any sense. Well, you had a really good offensive coordinator, too. Wasn't Ernie Zampezi there at the time? Ernie's the best, smartest coach ever. And he still has coaches in the league now that learn from him. Well, his you son's know, going to be the offensive coordinator for the Bengals this year. Is it? Well, I, he's a, the Bengals, gonna, they got a great one, you know. And and, and um, Ernie was one of those kind of coaches that coach coaches, and he was – Ernie was the best. All right. Great also, guy. You talked also a little about Eric Dickerson, one of the great running backs that ever played in the NFL. What was it like playing with Eric? Eric was great. He was a great guy, good friend. You know, he's still doing some great things in the community with the football camps and stuff. So Eric is Eric is a stand-up guy. He's always Eric has always been the same guy he was then now, you know. So, you know, I, I always admired him and respect him for all his accomplishments and on and off the field. Yeah, also, I mean, it had to be something for you to be elected at a Pro Bowl, what, your second season? Yeah, I, I don't remember what season it was, but it was that was a good chance, too. We had a lot of fun, too, at the Pro Bowl, too, the, being able to be there and around, the, you know, some of the elite guys are in the league and stuff. And, it, you know, in Hawaii, you know, that was a vacation by itself, though, so. You know, we had a lot of fun. I remember I was running a kickoff back up there, and they were like, Ron, we just, we, we ain't, this ain't serious. Slow down. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> well, nowadays they play touch at the Pro Bowl, so. Oh, yeah, no, it's not, it was, back then it wasn't either, though. You know, I'm trying to, you know, break free. They're like, no, no, don't do that. Stop that. <laughs> Run out of bounds. <laughs> now, I would say maybe the best team you were on, 1985, the team goes to the NFC Championship game, plays the Bears. You guys lose 24 to nothing, but you want to talk a little bit about that year and that team? Yeah, that, that was a great year for us, though, and that, and the, and that we just couldn't put it together. The, the weather was terrible for us, though, because we're coming from sunny out to, to you know, below zero wind chill factor and stuff like that. That just was a – and we got there the day before, so it was kind of a culture shock for us weather-wise when we got there these guys come up with no sleeves on and being short pants and stuff i'm thinking oh shoot this is gonna be a cold day you know <laughs> and you know we just weren't used to performing i think all nfl games need to have domes i mean they make way too much money to be having the element of the weather part of part of that yeah but don't you think it's it, part of home field advantage yeah, but now nah, you don't need no home field advantage. You know, everybody, let's just play, let's just play. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I think it is part of it, though, but, you know, they need, they need to take that out of the equation at this stage of the game. Yeah, well, I used to be against dome stadiums when I was younger, but now as I'm older, I wouldn't want to go sit outside when it's 10 you, degrees. Can you so. imagine? That's I know. I never, I, mean, it's like, I never understood that. You know, you're paying yeah, $200 when I, when I was to sit the in the snow. I'm a Bengals fan, and we're in the Cincinnati area. When I was like 12, 13 years old, the Bengals played that 59 below game against the Chargers. I was mad at my dad because he wouldn't get tickets and take me because he said it was too cold. <laughs> now I understand because you know, I took my kids to a Bengals game like three or four years ago. It was like 35 degrees, and I was freezing my ass off. So oh, the older yeah. you get, the less you can adapt to that also. Oh, man. Imagine. God almighty. <laughs> well, and, and another thing you went through, 1987, the player strike. Um, what are your recollections of that? Yeah, no, that that was, you know, I understand what they were trying to get accomplished, though, but my whole thing with the strike was, I mean, I didn't cross or anything like that, but I didn't actually get out there and start picketing either, though, because I told them, I said, listen, you know, if we're going to really strike, then we need to strike on Sunday. That Our fans really don't care about us between, you know, Monday and, and Saturday. I said, if we show up on Sunday and don't come out or we come out in flags and now you're making a statement, that's a better statement. So if you guys aren't willing to do that, then, you know, I think this is a waste of time. So, you know, I'm not sure what we got accomplished with the strike, but, you know, it, 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 everything happens for a reason. So we just we had to go through it. 
A lot of guys lost a lot of money. Some guys got cut, and, you know, I don't know. And then, I don't know. And then you go to 1988, 87, of course, the, or let's see, the Rams lost Eric Dickerson from contract negotiations. Well, I know that you actually came back and started running track again because of the Rams and negotiations. How difficult were they to deal with? Uh, you know, Georgia, you know, she used to tell me that, you know, this was a business for her. It was a hobby for the Al Davises and the DeBartlos and everything else. All they had other businesses, but this was her business. So, you know, she had to, you know, keep her overhead down and kind of understood her model at the time. But, you know, it when it when it comes to the loyalty with the teams and guys, you know, actually working together and feeling good about working together and doing the extra for each other, that kind of thing, that camaraderie that goes on with that. So you got, when you break that up, then, you know, the, the game changes a little bit when you realize the game is not a sport, it's a business. Yeah. And what's your take on the way the NFL deals with the retired players, especially the guys from like the 60s, <clears throat> 70s, even the 80s? Well, we're doing some some real good things now. You know, it, it's we're doing we have the NFL Retired Players Congress, and the Congress is going to do some extra stuff for for guys. You know, um, like final expense insurance, so they're not a burden on their family when they pass. Uh, we're going to be having some uh, assisted living homes. That will be mansion style, so guys, if they need to come stay somewhere, we'll have somebody take care of them, and they don't have to go into a regular assisted living facility. So um, the NFL has partnered with the Congress as far as allowing us to have licenses, and part of the proceeds from the license goes to a fund that will allow these things to happen. And I have to say, you know, thanks a lot to Joe Brown for having the vision and to seeing our vision and uh, Leo Kane over in licensing to help us put this program together. That's exciting, very exciting, and, and I'm looking forward to some of the things that's in, in our future. All right, and you're working with them, right? Yes, uh-huh. I work with the Congress. Okay. What else are you doing these days? Uh, we have a homeless shelter down in Temecula, and uh, we also have a drug rehab facility down in down in Orange County, we have a drug teen program that we deal with with teens and they're that's having you know drug dependencies, and we're trying to uh, get them off. We have a program that we do with Children's Hospital uh, Champions Fund uh, that deal with a lot of at-risk kids. You know, I'm part of one of the largest gang intervention programs here in Los Angeles because uh, we're having a lot of in- incidents with these kids killing kids and dropout rate, and you know, trying to get these kids active. Like my grandmother always told me, an idle mind. Is a devil's workshop. So we and we now have a youth football team called the Crenshaw Rams. And the Crenshaw Rams, the youth football team, we're going to get the, all the kids to be able to play for free so that all the kids can come out there and be active because we understand that we have them on the football field that they're not out committing a crime or gang banging or things like that. And we make sure that the kids get their homework done and try to find tutoring for them if they need assistance. So we got some pretty exciting things going on out here, saving lives and making lives better. That's our motto. Oh, sounds really good. Um, so what do you, what's your take on the Rams coming back to L.A.? <clears throat> Excited about it. You know, Stan Kroenke is one of those kind of guys that, you know, he's a great owner, team owner. I met Stan years ago before he actually bought the Rams. I met him in Vegas when he was wanted to meet Georgia to buy the Rams. And, um, we have a facility that we're going to be t- talking to the Rams about. We have 170 acres in Carson that we want to develop into a sports youth center that we're going to be talking to the Rams about partnering up with to do that. And that's going to be a state-of-the-art uh, youth complex with volleyball, indoor volleyball, soccer fields, football fields, baseball fields, um, technology. It's going to have a school there. It's going to have an amphitheater there for performing arts. It's going to be a great facility. All right. Hey, Ron, it was great having you on the show today. And, I mean, it's really great hearing the things the NFL and yourself are doing to help the youth and to help the retired players. Well, great. Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, hey, anytime you want to come back on, you're more than welcome. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. You have a blessed day. You too, Ron. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, guys, check us out at thegruelingtruth.net for all of our shows, all of our articles everything you could possibly want to see there. You can follow us on iHeart. You can find us on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, 
um, Google Music, pretty much anywhere they have sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. Make sure you check out Gridiron Mo at www.gridironmo.com. So for Ron Brown, I'm Mike Goodpasser. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.